Hello, my name is Brenda Reimer and I am the Knowledge Mobilization Officer for the Poultry Innovation Partnership. Since February of 2021, PIP has been pleased to bring you the latest and the greatest from the academic world of poultry research, and that's through our monthly innovation showcase. But we all know that mobilizing knowledge doesn't just stop once the research is over. And at PIP, we have a passion for advancing our industry. So we want to learn from you, our farmers and our industry. So to do that, we're taking things on the road. Four times a year, we're going to be visiting an innovative farmer to learn about how they are doing things differently, why they chose to do things differently. And honestly, at that point, we're probably just going to see where the conversation takes us. So today we are traveling to meet Mike Froze, the owner of Five Mile Farms. Mike has experience as a broiler producer and currently runs an organic layer operation just south of Camrose. We hope you'll join us for the journey. Good morning, Mike. It's just really, uh, <laughs> it's really nice to be here and for you to have us here just to talk about um, some of the changes that you've made. I know you've got a bit of a story to tell about how you've upped your game, what you're doing with biosecurity. It's all around risk management. Right. So uh, we, my dad always says you can't live long enough to learn from all your own mistakes, right? You have to learn from somebody else's right. sometimes. Right. So what kinds of things are you doing or, or do you consider when you're measuring your risk? Should I do it? Should I not do right. it? Are you working with anybody to do that? What is the mm -hmm. process that I'm you go through, through? I'm working through my life experience. Ah. I had a barn that was struck by lightning and burned. Oh, wow. So I know that yeah, lightning had all. <laughs> strikes. It absolutely strikes and burns things down. Yeah. We've seen it. We know that if we're, like ourselves, we're in an industry that, that has specific perils that we should mitigate for those perils. Salmonella is a peril. I'm also organic. And for a time, we couldn't actually... We couldn't actually vaccinate for it because it was a genetically modified organism. Um, we got that changed. We can now vaccinate it for it. And we do because that's one part of the mitigation process. The other, of course, the, the largest one is making sure that the pests don't get in and we have a pest control program. But between taking care of pests and uh, vaccinating for salmonella, my hope is we're not going to get it. We, of course, we're not using this. We're using this. We're putting in uh, mesh. We're doing everything we can with the resources that we have to, to uh, I can't say eliminate, but at least decrease the peril to a point where we're not going to suffer from that. Uh, and you could talk a little bit about uh, some of the changes you've made or how you've been a little bit more intentional around biosecurity. Sure. Why don't I start at the beginning? So <laughs> it's a great place to start. <laughs> the beginning is quite simple. We always talked about biosecurity. When I used to have broilers, uh, we talked about changing footwear. So it was simply, all we needed to do is draw a line on the ground. It was a painted line to make sure you step over it, put your new boots on, etc. cetera. Um, that's a great start. And that was a 1990s kind of start, mm -hmm. early 2000s. But uh, I think early on we found that the uh, painted line didn't do what it should do. It didn't stop you from actually running into the barn in an emergency or something. Uh. So uh, soon after that, um, we decided to build Danish entries. And Danish entries were the next step up and they're a necessary step. You gotta have a place where you can sit down, stop, take off your shoes, put on something else. And we found that actually when there was an emergency, we did take off our shoes, jump over the Danish entry and go in. So it was a really good, place uh, or a really good object that would stop us from our previous behaviors of not changing a boot even in an emergency so yeah. or in an emergency so i just know that uh you've been through some things with your farm you yeah. you've had uh you shared with us at western poultry conference some of your challenges that you had with salmonella and then i know in 2022 you uh, also had Indian. Had avian yep. influenza, and so I just uh, I'm interested to know if that's made any changes in in how you're operating now. Okay, so we went from Danish entries <clears throat> to what other vectors, what other things 
can transmit disease. Well, in the case of salmonella, rodents. So we actually rebuilt a barn from the uh, walls up. We took all the walls down, took all the insulation of the ceilings, um, and we actually um, added a uh, pest mesh material to all the barns. And when we built the pull-up barn, we integrated it right away with the whole um, a gravel walkway or a gravel area around uh, the facility. But a pest mesh and a, and a um, oh a uh, landscape fabric underneath the gravel and the pest mesh actually moves its way see about two or three feet out and then up the side of the barn and it's stapled right onto the barn so that pests can't burrow under and can't burrow in we added um we added a rock saw insulation above our spray foam insulation so we made it so that Basically, we've got little mini fortresses. Yeah. We don't get pests in our barns. We have a program outside. We have a professional that comes by and checks oh. at least once a month, if not twice a month, and does the inspection for the, uh, the mice, uh, bait stations, etc. So that's what we did both with our footwear and also with, um, you know, with uh, pests. But then there's also an additional layer that I need to figure out, and that's with regards to avian influenza. It's not just footwear, clothing, et cetera, that we've got to watch out for. It's also air. My next uh, amping up or, or ramping up the game will be finding ways to treat air that comes into the barn. Yeah, you, you, you know, you talked about this leveling up, you know, so you dealt with the boots and the human behavior, really. Yeah. Then you, you uh, went at it from a pest point of view. And now, mm -hmm. you know, we think about all the things that come into a, a barn. So in that leveling up, when you moved from, um, you know, the changing the line on the floor to mm -hmm. moving into a Danish entry, and yep. then you moved into, into the pest point of view, it, did it make a difference? Uh, were you seeing uh, less pests, uh, you know, that professional that was coming around, less mice, that kind of thing? Were they, was that helping in that so regard? So specifically the mice, we eliminated the mice from the barns, from the inside completely. Excellent. That, that's gone. We did find um, that they move around the farm. There's areas where there will be next to no activity. And then the professional will say, actually, this area is really high activity so we'll we'll concentrate on that area and then we'll find that it moves etc so so uh you know what i'm hearing is that just having that uh professional come and check it is kind of takes that that uh, little bit of management attention off of you put on somebody else and then you can just deal with the 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 next steps well, once I, it's identified if i could backtrack a little bit to where we all started as farmers, where I started as a farmer. You start at this base level, we haven't got enough time, we've got to do everything ourselves, we won't pay attention to this. And as you go on through this game, you realize there's some things that you just need others to take care of. There's some things that we can take care of. Pest management and having a professional pest control specialist on site on a regular basis is actually a requirement in some provinces. Mm. And um, I'd go so far as to say, just like, you know, um, injecting for salmonella, it should be a requirement. We need to amp up our game. We need to step it up. Um, if we can take that, um, that practice or what's the word I'm looking for that, that I don't want to say a headache, but that's one thing that could easily just, uh, fall by the wayside. I've seen pictures where, you know, uh, there'll be an analysis of the pest, um, program in a barn and you'll see these traps and they're all covered in dust. Why? We don't want to touch them. They're gross. Yeah. Right? So you get the professional in, that's their job. They maintain them. They're taken care of. It's, it's just one, uh, it's a way of closing up the gates that can easily be left open, although ostensibly we're taking care of things, but we're not. Yeah, exactly. It's like either you're doing it or you're... You're not really doing it. Yeah. Just like when we used to have the foot baths, right? Like, yeah, yeah I got a foot bath. Okay, how often do you change it? Well, never. It's gross, right? Yeah. So, okay, eliminate foot baths. Let's do footwear. Let's do Danish entries. Let's stop ourselves. So in terms of upping the game, there's always something new in a sense. Like three years ago, I never thought about treating air. Never thought yeah. about it. Now it's like, I'll never put a sidewall in, in again. I will treat air, period. 
Right. And that, and that sort of that motivation, just describe to us what, what happened, what you think, uh, your theory around how you well, ended up, given that you leveled up your biosecurity, mm -hmm. you know, you, you've gone through quite a process yes. in leveling up and you know, we often hear avian influenza, you know, oh, it's related to poor biosecurity. Yep. Um, and, and it can be. And, it, and, and from what I understand, more likely than not, uh, shared equipment, um, quickly running in to check something. Mm -hmm. Well, that quickly running in just brought something in. Those things happen, like shared machinery. All of a sudden, you'll see um, the disease is so virulent, you'll see where it starts. And you'll see the area where the bobcat entered the barn or whatever it was. You'll see that spot. In addition to that, though, we know that flies can carry avian, that under certain circumstances it can travel between 80 and 100 meters. We haven't done any tests with windstorms and proximity to um, geese in fields eating peas, for instance. But one thing I do know anecdotally is that you, as we've seen the disease start where biosecurity was breached through footwear, we can also see where biosecurity is breached through air inlets. So in, in my case, um, I'm convinced it came through the north air inlets. We saw the disease move from north to south in the barn. We did counts for at least two days. After that, we couldn't keep up. Oh. But you could actually see the amount of dead on the north side versus the south side. So it would be like, you know, call it 60%, 30, and then 10, right? So it followed that it pattern entirely. Yeah. So where did it come from? Well, the inlets are here. The top tier is here. They all start, started uh, dying on the top tier. It was pretty obvious. I've heard of other farmers, same thing. Um, top tiers, uh, top rows. Well, unless somebody's walking on the top row, how did it get there first? Yeah. So that's what really tweaked me. Tweaked me? Is that a word? Yeah, tweaked me. <laughs> tweaked me, tweaked yeah. me. Um, that we need to do something different. We need to treat air like we treat water, like we treat feed, like we treat biosecurity and footwear. There's all these components, and I'm sure in two years there'll be another layer. We'll say, we never saw this, but now we need to deal with it. We know something about it. There'll be the naysayers. Oh, heavens, no, it couldn't be that. And then three or four years after that, it'll be common practice to take care of it. Just like right now, air mm -hmm. is just, oh, heavens, no, it couldn't be that. It's got to be sloppy biosecurity. And in four or five years, everybody's going to be like, get some money uh, and redo your inlets. So, you know, there's some steps that you can take. I, I mean, there's some innovation that you can bring into your farm to help with the air. But in the meantime, yeah. uh, bef before you make a big investment or can get that equipment or get it working on yep. your farm or whatever. What what are some things that you might try? Um, you know, we're weeks away okay. from that season. So Fair what enough. are some things that you might try just right now if you don't have the money, if you're not convinced, uh, but you might want to try to do something a little bit different, sort okay. of a halfway step. We'll, we'll start with continue with your biosecurity. Continue with changing footwear. Consider... Uh, in sensitive areas like say a pull-up barn showering, sh showering in, showering out. Um, but also, you know, first identify if you have a problem in your area. If you don't have migratory fowl and you don't have anything landing close by, you're not likely going to need to do much more than that. Um, if, however, you're in a, an area that has wild fowl, you have um, uh, snow geese close by, you need to do something. Consider um, things like, I've heard, using landscape fabric over inlets, um, using different sets of inlets. For instance, uh, AI started on the north side of my barn. Um, it's kind of a wind tunnel from the road where the geese were. I wouldn't use those inlets again. If there's geese on that side, those inlets are closed. I won't even filter it. I'll draw from the south side, but I have enough inlets. I'm not starving them for air. Um, it's just a better airflow with both sides working. But heck, I can do it with the, the one side just as well. So I would, I would manage the problem by identifying the issues and also the severity of the issues first. Yeah, for sure. Really, really being, again, intentional about what is going on, what's a potential threat, right. and what are some things I can do. You know, you talked about landscape fabric, and 
and sort of that uh, five years from now, we're all going to accept it. I, I think there's work to be done. Uh, there's research and science that needs to happen to, to really uh, scope out what is the pro problem. But in the meantime, <laughs> we've got a risk floating around, uh, well, potentially around us. It, so if I can add to that, that's what I heard a farmer say in BC. Uh, this farmer was saying, you know, we've got to do something. And uh, the farm hands were like, well, this is a big deal. Like, you know, pr what can we do? And the farmer said, we'll get landscape fabric. Well, that won't work, they said. He says, it might work. It might work. Let's just try it. Well, it might be too dense of a fiber or too loose. He says, we'll find one that works. And if we can stay farming for an extra day or two or three, let's do it. And this farmer made it through the entire season and farmers broke on the south side and the north side, but not his. Yeah, it's interesting. I know we've done a little bit of work with that landscape uh, fabric, and we did notice that there was, you know, a reduction in the airflow uh, in the barns. But um, I just wonder, in the meantime, mm -hmm. for, for a period, yeah. can, can it work? What are some other things? I know you've been thinking about this for a while. So what are some other things that, uh, you know, you might want to, further steps that you might want to take around the, air managing the air coming into your well barn. i mean i guess honestly the the landscape fabric is a stop gap mm, right for sure closing inlets is a stop gap right um there's products out there uh from quebec if i'm not mistaken i don't know if i'm allowed to say this the esa 3000 it not only is a um, heat exchange unit they're developing a cooling exchange on it and a filter so they're treating air as an object, and I think moving forward, I would love to have every single barn um, outfitted with a way of, of managing air, much like I manage my water, much like I manage my feed, much like I manage my biosecurity. We have to see these components all working together and not uh, just relying on one component, albeit an important one, like changing footwear, which is super important, changing clothing, super important, but if that's all we do, we're not we're not moving forward. We're not figuring this out. We're just mm -hmm. using the same old practices. Oh, and guess what? We broke. Kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, we don't know how it came in. Well, do you know how many you people know? say, gee, I hope I don't get it. Yeah. Well, you know what? Last time I checked, this doesn't work so good. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't work. I did the same. Gee, guys, let's change our boots. Let's do everything. We've got to ramp up biosecurity. Gee, I hope we don't get it. Well... Yeah, that doesn't work. It didn't. It didn't work for you that time for sure. So the snow geese landed in the field right about there, and I mean, I say eight to ten thousand. I don't know, but it was thousands. Yeah, it certainly was wasn't loud. fifty thousand, but it certainly wasn't a thousand. Mm -hmm. So I say between eight and ten thousand. And were there dead birds on the? There field? weren't there, but if you go, um, if you go one mile this way and one mile this way. And the same over here where the sloughs are, you would see deads. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get into the field to see the deads, but there were deads all around you could see. Anyway, we had them feeding. This was a pea field last, well, I guess it'd be, yeah, last year. It was a pea field, and they had landed there in the springtime to feed. And then somewhere around the middle of April, we got a really good windstorm. And the windstorm, as you well know, blows things. And I suspect there is a pile of feces and dander here. And we have a driveway that runs, you can't really see it, but there's a driveway that runs from the center here, right past barn three. And we get some fierce winds and you get that fierce wind blowing like from west to east, like a tunnel. If they were right there, you can see the driveway moving down and there's the inlets. Right. The geese were right there. I wish I had my fingers with a finger and not so like farmer <laughs> I think we get it. Okay. And where do we get avian? I wish you keep it big right there. Those inlets right there. It went in. Didn't get it in barn four we tested. Didn't get it in barn one we tested. Barn three we did. On that side and moving from the north side to the south side over four days. Right. So, I mean. And as you said, it was coming in from the top tier. So top it's tier. not like somebody walked through there with no. with dirty boots. It, it, it was came the, in a It was the way. entire length of the row, top tier, and it moved from the north tier to the south top tier. Mm. And we didn't have any in barn four and we didn't have any identified AI in barn one. So clearly your biosecurity was working. That's what we think. 
we we have uh, two, one, two, we have three Danish entries in our gathering room. One when you enter and one into this barn and one into that barn. We changed footwear and outer clothing when we went in there. So, and we have a shower and shower policy in this barn. So we did it and yet we still got it. Yeah. So we need to figure more things out. Yeah, you had it on your farm and you were still able to keep it out of the, out of the, um, out of the other facilities. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And that's, that's the farm. And so when you go to close, you were talking about closing those. The, these inlets. inlets. It's, it's these inlets yeah, along the side right. here that you're going to. If we have any activity here in the spring, these inlets will be deactivated for that time. And I'll draw air from this, from the south side. I have enough. Like I, you know, you, you got to make sure you don't choke them off their air. But it's still a cool time of year. Um, we have more than enough inlets. So we'll just draw it from the other side of the barn. Right. And you're going to work with your neighbor to potentially deter, yeah. hopefully deter birds. From I'm going to ask if it's okay if I can shoo them away. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we'll shoo them if we get them again. With those sound. Sound cannons and yeah. or laser and or any other ideas we can think of. Right. For sure. Yeah. And you've had the benefit, uh, I'll say, benefit of knowing the cost oh, of, yes. of having uh, a salmonella uh, in your barn or having avian influenza. So yep. you've had that uh, real and tangible assessment of cost, not just in terms of money, mm -hmm. but the emotional toll. Well, see, there, how do you measure the mental health cost? Yeah. How do you measure that? I can tell you that I just about lost my mind the first time. When I say lost my mind, it'd be like, I was just so ashamed. Oh my goodness, I must be a terrible farmer. No, there was risk that I wasn't mitigating for. I didn't have a proper pest control program, nor did I have the mesh that I now um, I've surrounded my buildings with. I had pests. Well, guess what? I learned that we have to face these demons head on. So it's not enough to just wish something doesn't happen and hope that it doesn't happen and count your lucky stars yeah. that it didn't happen. You need to do something about it. Yeah. And you need to do it not just because of the economic cost, but the emotional toll. You don't want to go through this stuff. It sucks. Yeah. I, I appreciate you that you, you bring that up, that emotional toll uh, side of it, because often, you know, it's interesting when we're talking about taking on new practices or new innovation, that's always the, the question. What's the ROI? Um, right. And so ROI is one way of evaluating, one um, way. Uh, you know, new taking on new practices, but uh, you know, this emotional toll, uh, being out of production for a long time, the, 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 the anxiety around yep. it, it, all of that is, is huge. Uh, Mike, you, you have a lot of experience to draw on. And so just looking back, is there anything that you would have changed? Yes. If you could have provided me, or if you can provide me the little time machine, I would go back to about three or four weeks beforehand and say, hey, you know that flock of snow geese across the street? That's a problem. Make sure you manage your air differently. I would have closed all the inlets on the north side of the barn. Yeah. That's what I would have done. I would have drawn from the south side. Um, I would have probably gotten some kind of a laser system or some kind of a bang system and gotten rid of those geese. Rather than just letting him sit there, I would have actually intentionally chased them away. But because we were practicing good biosecurity, we'd upped our game, we changed our, our shoes, we changed our clothing, we used the showers, we thought we were fine. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yep. Yep. So as far as you knew about biosecurity, you were, we were we doing were the it. best you We could were be. doing it. We're going to be all right. We're going to yeah. get through it. We're going to cross our fingers and we're going to get through it. To me, that's the biggest lesson, yeah. you know, uh, in all of it. Y you could be the, the best you've ever been, but there's potentially there's still more to d be done. Absolutely. So. You know what, like in the case of, say, salmonella, you can do all those things. If you have rodents, you're in trouble, mm -hmm. right? So you can't just rely on one security system per se, right? It's just yep. like saying, you know, I'm not going to get salmonella. Why? Well, i got cameras everywhere. Well, I mean, like, cameras are great for some things, but not others, yes, right? So for salmonella, footwear, absolutely. But if you've got pests, you've got a problem. 
AI, footwear, again, super important. Clothing, super important. You can track it in. Shared equipment. Um, but what you really need to focus on is also, in addition, perhaps drawing and filtering air differently. Right. All those, all those things that are coming into the Everything. Place. So you need to have multiple layers, multiple systems, and it's not rocket appliances. Right. The field across the road uh, that had the geese, is that your field? No. Mm. So. So you'd have to be working with, a, with, with your the neighbor, neighbor yep, to, to solve that problem. Yep. So that, I mean, that, that's another thing, right? Like often we, we think about our farm and the fortress, as you've talked about, the barns that we've done, but you're having to go, you're drawing that circle wider about where you need to be paying that attention, yep. not just at, at the, at the farm level right. or at the gate level, but even, you know, beyond community. that, the neighbor community to neighbor. level. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's also a lesson that we, we haven't really thought about. We, we tend to be really, um, intentional conscientious about what's happening in our fortress and our barn. Um, pretty good about what's, what's happening at the gate level. Yeah. But uh, this situation about uh, wildfowl and peas, uh, it's not unique to right. you. Right. I think there's a, a bit of a commonality around, around Alberta mm -hmm. uh, that we've seen in some of the cases. So it's good to think beyond that. So it's that, if you will, out of the box thinking. Uh, we need to that think we need bigger, to think. and we need to think on multiple different levels. Again, if you want to think about it this way, you would never just draw water from a puddle and drink it and think it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. I am not drinking water from a puddle, and I'm not going to let my birds drink water. From no, a puddle. because the risk just seems too high, not worth it. Also, it's disgusting. Also, it's disgusting. So, I'm going to ask you a question, Mike. You also work for Burnbray. Yes. Um, and I in like a technical service kind of more technical. It really actually depends on the context. So, um, I, I'm the producer industry representative for Alberta and Saskatchewan. Okay. So that means I do whatever needs to be done to keep things rolling. So if I need to talk to you, if I need to talk to a farmer about a housing system, if I need to make sure we get the proper product in the plant or meet with the minister of ag, that's what I do. So, uh, how would that translate? Are you on farms? Are you going to farms? Yes, I do. I go to farms. I talk to farmers and uh, we talk about everything. And in terms of your visits to farms, are, where are you seeing, um, how do I say this? Areas where they could level up. Absolutely. Uh, in biosecurity. What would be And I'm very your frank experience? with farmers that need to level up, especially when they aren't taking things seriously in the current context. I was at a farm and I remember saying, why aren't you changing your footwear? Everybody knows you change your footwear. Build a Danish entry right now, like right now. And uh, they did. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah, some of the things I see sometimes is, um, 90% of the people who come to the barn change their footwear. <laughs> and then there's one who doesn't because they have a different, you know, uh, the kids come running in or... Uh, they're, they're disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. And I've seen that. I'm telling you I've seen it. I've seen it where I've warned someone and disaster struck. I've uh, seen it. Yeah. And then and, and unfortunately... Um, it's those experiences that change us. It's, we don't, we don't change because everything is good. Hey, nothing's ever happened to me. I'm going to do this to mitigate for disaster. You know, you don't, you change when you're, when, when your ass gets on. kicked basically. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't it be great? I, I mean, to me, that's part of why we're wanting to do, uh, this, this series, uh, to encourage producers to, to think about, leveling up their game, whatever it is, whatever security, it is. um, you know, managing in a different way so that they can do it before that they have to, they have to, and they you don't want do to go in through this. You don't yeah. want to go through AI. You don't want to go through a fire. You don't want to go through anything that makes you go gray. It's not fun. Um, you just want to make sure you have morning coffee and you do your chores and it's yep. all good and you go to bed. I mean, that's a great life. Fill out your paperwork. Yeah, yeah, fill out all that paperwork. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Because if you hate paperwork, 
AI is not the thing. No, for I'm telling you, honestly, the paperwork was unbelievable. Not to mention the washing, which is 1400 hours, 30,000 square feet inside, outside, upside down and on creepers and crawlers. And it was just unbelievable. But the paperwork, the amount, the mountain of paperwork I had to generate to offer compensation. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding you. Probably that much paper. Yeah. Five telephone books. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the, the pain just is oh, immense. Oh, it's just not worth it. <laughs> oh, you it's, want to avoid it. Yeah. Oh, for yes. sure. For sure. Yeah. So. I know that a hammer hurts if I hammer my thumb. This is a lot the same. Just do whatever it takes so you're not, you're not getting your thumb hammered by AI. Perfect. It's painful. Good. Well, I think that's a good place to to end the conversation. So again, Mike, thank you so much for your time and time. and uh, allowing us to take some footage on your farm. It's a it's a great fortress, um, and so I, I hope that uh, by sharing your experience and the pain that you've gone through, uh, that others can can learn from that and and level up their game. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed the, our interview with Mike. Uh, I've got Mike is here. Uh, he's going to be joining us on screen um, uh, in case you have any questions. So, folks, if you have any questions, please uh, add them uh, to the question and answer uh, box and uh, uh, I'll present them to Mike and we can have a bit of a talk about it. Um, I see already somebody has uh, provided us with a question. So I think that's that's great. Please, um, again, just remember to put them in the Q&A box. But uh, I'll, I'll start with this first question. Um, it says, this should be seen by all producers as an incentive to improve their biosecurity. Oh, it was a comment. Thank you so much for that, uh, Aaron. I mean, that is our hope, is that we can uh, spread the message. And, you know, again, learning from each other, from a from a producer to producer, you know, we they get it. They understand your situation. And, and we're hoping that that, there's a level of trust and related relatedness that that we can uh, generate through these types of uh, discussions. There is a question in the Q and A. So, um, where do you get landscape fabric, and are there different types which work better? That is a great question. Um, we've got Dr. Mohammed Afrizi here as well, uh, and Tanya Moraz from our team who worked on that project. Um, I'll just say very. Uh, briefly that we have a bit of a report. Uh, Mike, come back, unless you have to go. <laughs> um, we have a report on uh, the Poultry Innovation Partnership about some of the work that we did. And I will say that landscape fabric, I think, has its limitations. Uh, we do believe that there are potential for some type of screening or protection of air coming in. But again, there's much work to be done. Um, all of these things, you know, it leads nicely into my next question for Mike uh, about, uh, he's talking about closing the north inlets and just using the south uh, inlets. Uh, Tanya, just put the link there, I see, for the landscape fabric. So you can, uh, that little trial that we did, you can check that out. But Mike, you talked about, um, you know, just drawing air from the, from the south inlets. And I just wondered if you could talk about what are the things that you're going to be monitoring? Because this is a change in your practice. It's a change in how you normally do things. There's a reason why you draw from the north and the south, but now you're going to change it and just kind of go that half step. Um, what are you going to be watching for in your barn? Uh, not just from a, do I have AI, but from a, you know, am I giving the birds the right quality of air? Am I moving air in the right way? How are you going to monitor that to make sure that you're doing your best, recognizing that it is a bit of a compromise, but you're doing your best in this this situation. Okay, um, thanks for the question. Uh, the way that um, it works, uh, it, like it's a tunnel in the barn, but I do have sidewall, um, sidewall fans and tunnel fans. So it's just, like I say, if you, if you draw from both sides, I find the air is just so much pure, cleaner, nicer, smelly. Um, if I draw from one side, it doesn't smell as good. The ammonia can build up more, but then all I need to do is just run more fans. Then the nice thing about this time of year is that, you know, we're talking minus five to plus five this weekend might get to plus 16, but it's going to be, um, cooler again. I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna 
play with inlets or drawing air, this is an easier time of year to do it. We're not on minimum ventilation where it's minus 36 and it's not plus 30. Um, so I, I can, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm just going to monitor the, the uh, air quality and I use this thing right here and I use ammonia test strips um, to, you know, I, again, I just don't want to be drawing air from where I shouldn't draw it. Externally speaking, I'll be watching for the geese. If there's no geese, we don't have an issue. Um, we still have some snow on the ground, so we're not worrying about any um, any of the um, debris flying in the air just yet. So I'm kind of going all over the place, and I'm hoping I'm I'm hoping I'm answering your question. If I'm not, get me back on track. No, I think that's exactly it. I th what I'm saying, what I was, you know, hoping to get to, and you got there, is it's, it depends. It's contextual. So, you know, right now you don't have birds because you, and you've got snow on the ground. So the risk is probably a little bit less than it would be in the fall time where, uh, you know, they're, they're gleaning from the field, all the, whatever was left from, from harvest and that type of thing. Um, you know, the temperature matters, you know, if it was really hot or really cold, as you described, you know, the external temperature, you would be managing that differently. Uh, you're going to be using your ammonia strips to make sure that that air quality is still uh, in that uh, acceptable, acceptable yeah. range. You know, so there, it, it's not just uh, shut down the north side of the inlets and, and away we go. You are going to be very intentional and in monitoring uh, all of these things. You know, th the next question would be, well, how long do you think you're going to have to do that for? Well, it depends. Uh, it depends. I mean, again, this at this point last year, we had snow geese. We have relatively nothing outside. We have some Canada geese landing on some frozen ponds and starting to nest, and that's about it. And I haven't seen anything, I haven't seen any dead geese at all. So, I mean, this spring is turning out to be a very different kind of a spring. And I hope, I, I mean, of course, <laughs> I hope, I hope we don't see this again. But if we do see it, I know what steps I'm going to take. Yeah, we're just that much more prepared to know what to watch for and, and how to react when, when we're seeing things. I mean, we can, with every pass, we learn a little bit more. And so I, I appreciate that you shared with us some of the things that you've learned. Uh, one of the questions or one of the suggestions from uh, one of the participants is, would a shelter belt of trees around the barns work? I think so. I mean, part of the problem with... Uh, Again, this is just my anecdotal experience. Part of the reason I believe I got it in the north side inlets was because of that uh, wind tunnel effect. So, you know, we have the geese. I like how you circled that little area where they were and you could actually see the driveway. When we get wind storms, it cruises through there. So what if there was a way of stopping that wind tunnel? What if we had parked, you know, semi-trailers across the driveway? Would that have helped? I think so. I mean, why is it that I built my uh, pullet barn, you know, a thousand feet away from the other barns on the other side of a shelter belt and having the uh, fans pointed uh, eastwards rather than towards each other? I mean, we believe that shelter belts stop um, stop debris in, in the air. And I mean, in fact, I mean, I've been walking lots lately, trying to lose a few pounds. And I've been walking up and down my uh, Range Road 192. And you can feel the uh, the air change when you get closer and closer to the shelter belts around the farm. It stops blowing in my face and freezing it off. Like these are just things we know, and and it's intuitive too. Yes, shelter belts do help. Yeah, I appreciate that you that that question was brought up. What I think of trees, I think they're great. Uh, like you suggested in in you know blocking that wind. Um, but the thing I think about is. They also are a great place for birds to roost. So you've got mm -hmm. to manage that that thing. Some of the things that we've talked about is, as you've suggested, you know, blocking it with uh, semi trailers, but some sort of way to create baffles, if you will, to to prevent that uh, wind speed or, and the mm -hmm. flow. And you know, as the speed of the wind picks up, the size of the particle that it can carry also increases. Um, and it's not uh, it's the 
particles that the avian influenza virus attaches to that uh, might uh, cause a, a, a risk in, in terms of coming into our image. So we can yeah. cause those particles to drop uh, before they actually approach the inlets. You know, there may be some potential there. These are all sort of hypothetical, theoretical uh, thoughts right now, but definitely something that, uh, you know, we want to be testing and thinking about. So, um, there's another question here about many producers do not include hand sanitation to their D Danish entries. Do you? Yeah, like um, that's part of the program, I believe. I mean, I it's just one of those things that the auditors always check for. Do you have hand sand? So yeah, I mean, I I I have hand sand, but um, you know, the best the best thing to do again is. You know, with the whole Danish entry concept is changing the footwear and, and clothing. You know, hand sand, yeah, you know, don't come dirty from barn to barn. That makes sense too, right? Um, avian influenza, I don't know. I'm not I'm not entirely sure that, that would stop that vector, but certainly uh, you know, when you vaccinate birds and walk into another barn you have vaccine on, like see along those lines. So it's again, it's part of your strategy. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think we we may not know exactly the impact of each one of these things, but it's a it's a layered approach. So if we can, we're changing boots and changing clothes and you know not sharing equipment, cleaning our hands just seems like an obvious. And so part of your so, overall strategy. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's it just all ties right things. in. Yeah, for sure. Each um, you know we we've heard it. It's cliche already, but biosecurity is only as good as its weakest link. So if you leave a gap anywhere, uh, you you are opening yourself up to threat. There's another question here along that line about, uh, do you apply any biosecurity strategy um, to your water in the prevention of AI? Well, not necessarily in the prevention of AI, but what I do is I reverse osmosis everything. Uh, as a broiler producer in the old days, I was told I had the worst water they'd ever seen. <laughs> and that uh, they'd help uh, help me clean it up. So Maple Leaf was very kind and helped me put in a, an RO system. And part of the whole RO system is I also then inject chlorine into the water and, uh, you know, just treat it. And that's, so we get all the TDS out and then we inject with chlorine and clean it. And our pH is nice and low. So we're, we're around that 6.5 level. Um, yeah. Does that awesome. answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're doing that just on a routine basis. It's routine basis. Again, I would never consider, like when I first moved onto the farm, I didn't know I came from Abbotsford and we put, we just drew from a well and the water was great. And, you know, I'd never experienced Alberta water before and it was just very different experience. So yeah, I know I would never just drink our water and kill you. So, you know, again, with the air, I mean, why don't, why aren't we treating it? Like we need to treat air the same. Yeah, we talked about that, you know, all the things that come into a barn and we sort of, it, it's those things that we don't see. Water, we don't see, it's in the pipes. Uh, air, we don't see, it's in the pipes. I mean, even the virus, we don't see. So you, you don't see it. To, it's That's the most overlooked. frustrating part about all of this. You don't see salmonella. You don't see where it's, where it is. You don't see AI. It just appears. It's a little bit like magic. And that's why we're always doing the magic thing here because, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it isn't magic. It's real and you just got to understand how to attack it. And that's where that's where we win. That's where we can figure things out. We got to use our, our heads yeah. and just approach us. So yeah. Aaron made a comment here about uh, AI virus has been found uh, on the door handles and oh. outside doors. So hand sanitation. There you go. Just I didn't know that. Better. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Seriously, thank you. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah, so it's, it's critical again to, to just all of those possible entry points need to be thinking about i had no um, idea yeah question here about do you restrict vehicles to your yard during those high risk times we don't really get any visitors <laughs> um which is really nice but also kind of lonely out here <laughs> so um do i restrict vehicles Most just park at the house when it comes to, it's just to the house and you saw the parking area so yeah. but i mean we don't and we don't have visitors we don't bring people in the barns yeah, exactly. Yeah, I saw um, 
um, you know, I can verify that. And I think we even saw in the video, there's those signs as you, as you come in, you can't get very far before you are met with a bunch of signs that say, buy security, stop here, check in at the house. You know, so it's, there's not a chain across the driveway, which might be that next step to leveling up. But again, if you're, you know, in the right context, if you're measuring the risk, um, you know, you have to do what makes sense for each uh, each situation. So, um, but I can say that we parked <laughs> and waited until somebody came to see us. Yeah, yep, exactly. I would love to put up you know, gates and such. But I mean, if someone really wanted to get in, they could just drive through my field. So, you know. Yeah, they can still get through for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, let me just see if we've got any more questions here. Oh, another one. Um, it's a comment. Uh, most genetic companies use positive pressure ventilation with air filtration. Uh, so makes sense. But for current barns built, uh, this would be tough to implement. Uh, great comment. I think we're I seeing that in the pork industry as well, they're using positive pressure. So that's, if I can jump in on that, that's, that's what really uh, piqued my attention because the vets out here in Alberta were talking about that. They noticed that, um, you know, if, if uh, say with the, the hog barns, they noticed a difference in um, um, air, air transmission in, in the barns. If the barn drew air in through the soffits, and it like, wasn't a positive pressure barn, but if they drew the air in through the soffits and they had ceiling and let's say had less chance, and this is just anecdotal, less chance of getting um, ill than if they had sidewall in. That, that was what got me thinking about this whole aspect. And then of course, others were saying, well, maybe we need to go to positive pressure barns for, for poultry barns. And then there is, that, again, that company, that ESA 3000 company, they said, you know what? When it comes to filtering air and filtering for um, avian, you don't need, you know, this crazy air filtration system or or um, positive pressure. You just need these. And I, again, I'm I'm not the expert on this, but it just needs to be this kind of a filter, and that's enough to stop, you know, at least the particles from entering. Or again, I'm just I'm just a farmer. I'm just trying to explain something that makes sense to me. That there needs to be research on this. But it sounds to me that, I mean, if you had unlimited dough, yeah, let's go positive pressure barns, let's re-equip them. But it might not be that complicated. It might be just, you know, um, having an, an adaptation to your inlets or a new style inlet that, like, again, that ESA 3000, using these different systems to filter your air. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be an expensive filter system. It just has to be a filter system that works. So. Yeah, this is some of the challenge, you know, we've talked about research and it's like, well, there's so many different types of um, inlets and, and barn designs. It's like, well, how do we test each one? So I appreciate the comment of just, you know, thinking about what might work, uh, you know, trying some things that make sense. Um, but I think maybe some information about what to be measuring. I mean, farmers already know how to measure their air, but specific things that they might want to be measuring to see if this is truly working might might help along that line for sure. Um, you know, uh, we were, we were talking about the gates, and um, Pam commented that uh, she has one entry into her yard. It goes right past her barns um, before you can get to the house. So she has been quite intentional about limiting, you know, Amazon delivery drivers and and things like that, um, so that she is not being affected uh, in the same way. So again, it's a contextual kind of thing um, because those drivers are going past farms and backyard flocks and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a potential risk there for sure. Um, one more uh, question here, uh, it's from Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. Uh, it says, great presentation and thank you for your time, Mike. Um, I may have missed it, but how do you manage insects and have do you have any tips on that? Hmm. Well, um, insects inside or outside the barn? Um, inside, we're always limited as organic producers to the kind of products we can use. Um, you know, in the old days, I've heard of people using different methods to get rid of, say, darkling beetles in their broiler barns, et cetera. They're probably not approved. Um, it's a good question. Uh, fortunately, 
uh, with the downtime that my barns have been afforded through uh, avian and such, we don't have a lot of insects to deal with. We don't have any insects to deal with. Um, that doesn't mean to say I didn't have them in the past as a broiler farmer, but as an organic lay farmer, I'm not dealing with anything inside. Um, outside, again, we don't have a lot to go on. And again, we're always limited to the kinds of products we can use. So I don't know if I'm much help to you on that. Yeah, I would say some of the things that are uh, maybe helping you in that regard is your barn uh, build. You know, they're, they're fairly new barns, uh, concrete floors, things like that. So that, that does help. Um, the way you store and manage manure, um, you know, anything that can be an attractant to, to uh, insects, uh, you know, if you, how you manage that and the intentionality that you put around that can help you. It, it's not going to solve everything, but you have to go at it from a, a number of different directions about, uh, you know, what are they feeding on and how are they getting in and that type of thing, you know, and, and other, um, like I've been in hatching egg barns where they've used um, other insects to manage uh, the fly populations and things like that. So there, there are different ways. It's challenging. Would another insect be just as much a risk? I don't know. So, um, let's see. Oh yeah. So just a, a, a comment again about uh, the managing the the the, the dust. Yeah, that the makes dust, sense. Dust coming in and that type of yeah. thing. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about you know uh, the fact that there's no snow on the ground and there's no birds there. So the, the risk probably seems a little bit less. But yeah. we did see quite a bit of uh, problems in the fall, right after harvest. There's uh, again birds. Uh, gleaming and, off of the field and then birds um, and dust birds and dust and that type of thing so that context really does matter uh, all all those contextual things that we need to be thinking context about. matters otherwise why didn't we see it through winter like yes. what was the context <laughs> and that, and that, uh, yeah so that might be because the birds are gone it might be because the virus doesn't survive there's a number of things but you know and and i think that helps us to think about are there things that we it's not set it and forget it it's, you know, manage for the situation that you're in right now. Um, and some of these things are not, you can't do this forever. You can't, you can't draw just from the south inlets all through summer because then no. you'll probably run into some problems. But in this, at this time, during this higher risk, when the risk in one regard and lower risk in the other regard in terms of temperature, um, it might be a, a stopgap measure for sure. So... Um, I have come to the end of my questions. I don't know, Mike, if you had any last parting parting thoughts that you might want to share with us um, before we we uh, wrap up the Innovation Roadshow. I, I want to say I so appreciate your time. I know you were a busy guy. When we were there, your phone was uh, ringing off the hook. Um, you've got your own farm to manage. So I, I definitely appreciate you uh, sharing your, your experience with us and some of the thoughts and research and discussions that you've had about how you can uh, up, up your game. So I appreciate that time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Just tough watching on the screen, me talk. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> me too, Mike, me too. I was struggling. <laughs> oh, I had to close my eyes. <laughs> yeah, once we get past the cringe of it all, but uh, I think it, I, you know, by the messages that I'm, I'm getting here in the chat box, uh, folks are appreciating it. So uh, they've been gracious enough to overlook the fact that we're delivering it and they appreciate the message. So anyway. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate yeah. it.